From time to time we sing the song that we've just participated in, More Holiness Give Me. And in effect, that is a prayer to God in song that we might be more like Jesus Christ in thought, word, and action. And like all the songs, we need to give attention to the sentiments expressed by the words of the song. Holiness is a quality of being set apart. That's where the word saint comes in. Making us different from the worldly standards around us, which govern most people. In this song we just sang, we sing to have more holiness in our lives. It means more dedication to all things of God. We're saying, give me more holiness. So the question I ask now is, why ought we to desire more holiness? Well, I would like to answer that question under three points in this study. More holiness give me because I want to be like God. Number two, I want to be pure as the Bible teaches a human being is to be pure. And third is a very simple one, I want to go to heaven. I think sometimes we would do well to think during the day about these three points and say this is the way I intend to order my life throughout the day. Now I won't attempt to read that. You may have read it already, but this is a prophecy in Isaiah, the Messianic prophet. Isaiah 35, concerning the coming kingdom of the Lord. And he speaks of the conduct of the people who will make up that kingdom. He talks about the eyes of the blind would be open. He talks about how the lame would walk. And the deaf would hear and the dumb talk. He also prophesies, that is Isaiah does, about a highway. In verse 8, he says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for the redeemed. The wayfaring men, yea, fools, shall not err therein. The time, and Isaiah was speaking over 700 years before Christ walked this earth, that Christ lived would be the time that God would usher in the way of holiness for all men. We could well call it the way of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. We could call it the gospel road. We could call it the New Testament system of salvation and conduct. We have Peter saying this in 1 Peter 1 and verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And I remind you that conversation nowadays means our speech. But in those days of the King James Version, it meant the way you live, your conduct. We're to be holy in our conduct wherever we are. And we're to be holy because God is holy and He's called us to be holy. A dedicated people to do His work out of all of those on the earth. It is the gospel system that calls us to that way of holiness. So you can see God expects His people, the church, to be living a different kind of life their motives and their thoughts will be engaged in things different from the people who are oriented to the flesh and to this present system of things. But as we sang in the song and as we're taught that this way will be holy, uh, we notice that more holiness give me because it's no secret that God is holy. Isaiah 6.3 also reads, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy. 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of glory. Then the last book of the New Testament. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 8 reads, And the four beasts, or living creatures, the American Standard translates it, had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. So we see how that the Holy Scriptures extol God. And you can think of many songs, spiritual songs, psalms, that extol the holiness of God. Now the question may come up, how can I be like God? How can I be holy? I yearn for it, but how can I be? Well, I want to be like God. It's no secret then that God is holy. And so I want to be as He wants me to be. That means I must learn from His Word, for that's what it's given to me for, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to be like Him. Consider what He said in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Well, Peter's echoing that, isn't he, in what we just read. Paul also had the same thing to say in Ephesians 4.24, where he's exhorting the church at Ephesus and all those who are Christians, and put on the new man that after God hath been created in righteousness, now watch it, and holiness of truth. Now we've come a little closer down to how I can be holy. Holiness of truth. Remember Jesus said in a most oft-quoted passage of John 8, 31 and 32, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, there's the wholeness of truth. There's a truth that makes us free. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them. Now, that ties into the word holy, doesn't it? Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You do no violence to that passage to say, Lord, make them holy through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Do we desire to be holy like God is holy? Well, if we want to be like God, then there are certain actions that begin in the heart so we can be like God. So it all begins with the desire of the heart. I pause here to say anything that has to do with serving God begins with the heart, the inward man, the mind. It always does. Right motive, right attitude, right disposition of heart. So when I'm saying that I want to be holy, I'm saying I want to be pure as God defines pureness. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul said to the church in Corinth, Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Notice there must be in the mind of the person who would be holy as God is holy, a proper disposition of heart or attitude or viewpoint of God. We must stand in awe of God because of what it means to be God. He who was and is and ever shall be Lord God Almighty. In 1 John 3, 2 through 3, John says to children of God, members of the church, Beloved, now are we children of God. And it's not yet made manifest what we shall be. We know that if He shall be manifested, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him even as He is. And every one that hath this hope set on Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. You cannot disconnect the idea of being pure from what it is to be holy, dedicated to God. 
always it should be growing in our minds now. How has God ordained that I, a person who has sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, how can it be that I can be holy? How can I do that? And in the song that we participated in, as Christians, we were saying, let's be closer to God. I want to be more holy. I want to think more like the New Testament of Christ teaches me to think and act closer to it. Now, it isn't, that is, being pure isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. If you look round about you, most people choose not to do it. And it comes back to what Brother Buddy said in class this morning as to really the root of most all of our problems, whether it's in the home, in the school, in the nation, in the church. I did it my way. There's a reason that song was written, too, that Frank Sinatra made very famous, so did others. And at the end of all things, I did it my way. You'll never go to heaven and do it your way. You'll really never have a happy life on earth. As God defines happiness, using this life for what God intended to prepare for eternity with God in heaven, you'll never find happiness doing it your way. It's very hard to make everybody do things the way you want them to do it, when you want them to do it, and even for the reason you want them to do it. If you launch your life on that path, then you will forever be frustrated and maybe even worse off than that. That's the reason the Lord in His teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talked about He that would be greatest among you, let Him be your servant. You don't see that nowadays. Now, the world has never launched it and courted it and pushed it very much. Some in the world have sort of adopted that view. Ask not what you can do for your country, but ask what, or rather what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Well, that's a good idea. In other words, the country in this nation as it is, it's not here to just simply cater your every whim. Now, that doesn't seem to be the attitude today. And yet out in the world, regardless of whether it's 2,000 years ago in the time Christ walked this earth or in the time these letters were being written that make up the New Testament, that was the attitude of most people. But the Lord says, no, your idea is to submit to the Lord. He has already gone through this life. And he went through it as a man. And he overcame Satan and sin as a man. He, in effect, has blazed the trail for you. You simply must follow him. So the attitude of not my will but thine be done must be within the heart of every one of us if we're to know this holiness, if we're to be pure even as he is pure. So there's effort involved or we wouldn't sing that song, More Holiness Give Me. We wouldn't be aware of it. We wouldn't be thinking about it if we thought we had already attained in thought, word, and action to where there's no more room for growth. Yet the Bible teaches us a very dangerous attitude. He who thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. So we become holy by purging ourselves from sin. That is a constant thing. To become a Christian, to get remission of all sins in the past, to be born anew, one must hear the simple, powerful plan of salvation and be led to a belief in Christ by the teaching of the Bible that moves one to repent of one's sins as commanded in Acts 17.30, a willingness to publicly confess your faith in Christ, and complete your obedience to the gospel to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.24, or 27. So we see that's the beginning. That's the departure from the taint of sin in this world that originally separated us from God. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. Now the world round about us is not running over itself to find this kind of teaching. Because first of all, it means I have to deny myself. And that's unheard of these days. To deny yourself? Why well, is to exalt self? To find some way to live this life to get all you can get out of things. 
But that's not the way of the cross. And we also see another song along that line, the way of the cross leads home. Paul wrote to Timothy, remember, he not only needs to know this to be a faithful Christian, but as an evangelist, he's to teach it to others. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, and meet or suitable for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. One of the reasons the Lord's church has problems Various congregations, it doesn't make any difference. Well, of course, you can say ultimately it's Satan working on folks. But we're supposed to know how to resist Satan. Since the Bible says resist him, he'll flee from you. One of the big reasons that continually bothers and upsets the church is that I want to do it my way. There's not the spirit of submission. There's not the spirit of humility. There's not the willingness to let Christ have his way with us. Sometimes this means strong trials. Well, the Lord had said always, take up your cross daily and follow me. I don't know where we get this idea that you can live so righteous that there's never a trial. When the Bible says, no, it's really the opposite. When you think about Jesus Christ, when you think about the fact he was tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. Now, what did wicked people do to him? They killed him. In a terrible way. Sometimes then these strong trials come because we won't be moved off the truth. The Apostle Peter by inspiration wrote that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Though it be tried with fire. Might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1.7 Too often we're focused on getting heaven on earth. When Peter focused the brethren who were being persecuted for righteousness' sake, in other words, because they were holy, he focused them on where the reward would come at the end of this life. In this life, if you read through your Bible, it's always pictured as a place of trial and tribulation for those who will live holy lives. Because the eternal reward is what we're after. The world doesn't want to hear that. The communists used to make light, and still do, of... Christianity because it focused people to the reward of eternal life in heaven. And they would laugh at us because we wouldn't involve our things with just the affairs of the flesh on this earth in our lifetime. And they would talk about heaven as the Christian's pie in the sky by and by, making light of it. But that's not what the Bible does. People who live for themselves on this earth are revealing that they give no thought to the end of their lives or anything after that. And they give no thought to the end of this system at the end of the world. It's always just simply what we do now, as if now is always going to be as it is. Zechariah 1, or rather 13, in verse 9, prophesies regarding the Messiah's people. And I will bring the third part into the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. There's something that comes out here from Peter and Zechariah. Zechariah prophesying long before the church was established. Peter in writing part of the New Testament. And what was he saying? If you understand life in the flesh, if you're going to be led by the teaching of the New Testament, don't expect the whole world to run with you. Over and over again, he made that clear. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And most of the New Testament's written to members of the church to keep them faithful. And that ought to tell us something. Most of the New Testament written to members of the church to keep them faithful. When you read through the letters of the New Testament, you read usually God telling Christians where they've sinned, where they haven't been faithful, and what they need to do, what they need to correct. And that's most of the New Testament. 
I don't know how anybody reads the New Testament and doesn't see that he's saying you need to be holy and some of you aren't and I'm telling you what to do to be holy. Because remember, they are the ones that will receive the reward from Christ. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Which also tells us that the faithful servant of Christ is the one that's holy. Has been sanctified in obedience to the gospel. And has continued to walk in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship one with another with the blood of Jesus Christ, continuing to cleanse them from all sin. 1 John 1 and verse 7. But notice the perseverance. Notice the willingness to stick to doing what God said do and the way he said do it and for the reason he said do it. Notice there's no deviation from the straight and narrow way. There's always the desire to answer every question in all honesty in the light of the rightly divided word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And yet, so often when we get so moved in our emotions and our desires and our connections, we might always refer to this passage behind me, Colossians 3.17, and it's easy to quote that, but then in every aspect of life, it's not so easy to always abide by it. But we're expected to. If, is our desire, in other words, pure? Then we're being holy, pure as the New Testament defines purity in the life of a Christian. Now that's two of the points, and the one I have now should be on the mind of everybody. I want to go to heaven. Sometime when you're among the world at the workplace or in school or wherever you might be among friends that are not Christians. And they may say or do something or whatever that's contrary to the Word of God. You might very well say, I don't do that because I want to go to heaven. Or I'm doing thus and so because I want to go to heaven. I think you'd find that people nowadays never give that much of a thought. Or if they do, it's sort of like, well, yes, I can't say it myself, God loves me. And he gave Christ to die for me, and I believe that. Then we go ahead and live pretty much like we want to live. That's pretty much what people think of Christianity. But it doesn't work that way. And I again remind you, it's obvious that there's much to being sanctified and holy and pure in mind because most of the New Testament's written to Christians telling them how to do that and telling just what kind of traps the, the devil has laid for them that causes them to fall into so because the earth isn't going to endure forever, we must prepare for the new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, which means it's pure and holy and there's no taint of sin in it. How do we get ready? We've been saying it all along. By holy living. This is exactly what Peter said. Now, you know if God, who loves us and gave His Son to die for us, and He went through such excruciating shame and pain that we can be, or else all that He did for us we never could do for ourselves is in vain. It's worthless. It's pointless. But He made us free moral agents. We have the power of choice. You chose to come here today. You didn't have to. You'll choose to read your Bible or you'll choose not to, to pray or you'll choose not to. You'll choose to obey the gospel or you'll choose not to. We will give account to God according to the choices we make when we stand before Him at the last day. So it simply comes down to understanding life in the flesh on this earth is nothing more than to get ready for heaven. Would that make a difference with all of us and being holy as He is holy through the system He's ordained, the gospel system written in the New Testament? When we face whatever tempts us to want our own way, to have our own way. If we would strive for the Lord's way, the way we strive sometimes to get what we want when we want it, what a difference it would make in this world. But that's just not the reality of it with many people. But holy living, our actions, our conduct all day long every day is set out in the New Testament. And you know, really, that's what you have when James is writing in James 1. Remember, he is writing to Christians. I've said that several times already and many times before regarding most of the New Testament. So look at how James writes when he comes down to James chapter 1. 
Beginning in verse 18. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's another way of saying, be holy. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now watch what's involved in being holy. This is something I must do and not do. Wherefore, lay apart. That's my responsibility. God's not going to do this for me. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Then there's something I must do. What I must not do, what I must do. And receive with meekness, see the disposition of mind, an attitude that will be commanded by God and willing to be commanded by God and wants to be commanded by God. With meekness, the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. What happens if I'm a hearer only? I deceive myself, he says. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. But if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now look at the contrast. But in contrast to that kind of man, who are we? Well, first of all, we ought to remember when we became Christians. When we humbled ourselves and obeyed the gospel as I described in the plan of salvation a moment ago. And that's when we rose from the watery grave of baptism, new creatures in Christ, our hearts set on doing God's will above and beyond all things, willing to make any kind of sacrifice to be obedient to His will. Now watch. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man, shall be blessed in his deed. And God has never promised to bless a person who was not an obedient servant. Thus, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Not obey me, not obey you, not obey any other man or group of men, but obey God. Now, there's only one place I know to find the commandments of God pertaining to the salvation from sin and being faithful, that is being set apart or sanctified, being holy, suitable for the master's service. Only one place I know that is. That's in the New Testament concerning living the Christian life. As a member of the church, Jesus shed his blood to purchase, Acts 20 and verse 28. That's why when you obey the gospel and your past sins are remitted, Acts 2 tells us he adds, the Lord himself adds us to others who believe and obey the same gospel. And thus they're Christians, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Not a member of any man-made congregation of any kind, but those who have obeyed the gospel and live according to the holy word of truth. In one way or the other, when you read these letters written to Christians, concerning how they need to live, that heaven will be their home. You'll see that it involves stopping this and doing something else. You can just sum it up that way. Stopping this kind of living, this kind of thinking, this kind of attitude, and learning to have this kind of attitude, this kind of thinking, and this kind of conduct. So it's holy living is what we're describing. And that's what we were actually singing about in the psalm before the sermon. More holiness give me. Now that's going to involve what part of that song says. More strivings within. You don't grow up in Christ. You don't become a stronger Christian. Unless in your mind as you study the mind of Christ in the New Testament, you're striving to bring every thought to subjection to Jesus Christ, which is an obligation each one of us has. Now, I say this so many times, uh, if you want a challenge that will last the rest of your life, however short or long your life is, just decide you're going to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ, and you'll have something to do every second of every day of every week. But that's how it works. 
And when you have a thought you know is contrary to the Bible, because you know your Bible, and how do you know it? You study it. It's in your mind. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee, David said. Well, do you have the power to rebuke yourself for having a thought that's contrary to the truth? Do you have the power to repent of that thought? Do you have the power to set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth? Which basically is dealing with what John said. What is the world? Why, he's talking about the way the world operates. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the vainglory, or the pride of life. Now, here's where you're going to hear John sound like James. I write unto you, fathers, 1 John 2, verse 13, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. But he adds this to it. This is more holiness give me in the writing of this very letter concerning Christian living. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world. Now what does he mean? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Those are the desires that are peculiar to the human fleshly body. That when bridled and guided and limited and directed by the word of truth, we use accurately. We use correctly. Because God knows you have to live on earth in a material world in a physical body. But it's the Bible that tells us not to be overcome with this world. And so that's what John's doing. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. It's such a strange thing that the gospel offers eternal life to people. And they fight it. They don't like it. And the reason why is because we said earlier, I want to do it my way. I'm not willing to submit to the teaching of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Peter writes, seeing that these things are thus all to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy living and godliness? Looking for and earnestly desiring the coming of the day of God, by reason of which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. But, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for these things, give diligence that ye may be found in peace, without spot and blameless in his sight. 2 Peter 3, 11 through 14. Heaven then is a place reserved for those who live their lives on earth in all holiness, who were sanctified by the word of God, who purposed every day of their life to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because of the faith in them built by thus saith the Lord proposition. They knew God would give them whatever they needed on this earth for the time they're here. In Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Again, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, 14, blessed are they that wash their robes that they might have the right to come to the tree of life and may enter in by the gates into the city. Again, from Revelation 21, 7, he that overcometh shall inherit these things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So do we desire to go to heaven? Do we remind ourselves daily that heaven is where I want to be when this life's over? Then we'll be holy, even as he is holy. Which means we'll abide by his will. Whatever he says, we'll do. Because he knows the way to heaven. It's through Christ and His gospel 
and faithful living according to the teaching of the New Testament. So what can we say? We must determine at all costs to live holy lives as the New Testament teaches what a holy life is. Of being first a member of the Lord's church, a Christian, which means of Christ and living righteous before Him. So when we sing that song again, or we're thinking of holiness or read it in a passage somewhere, more holiness give me, well, that's because I want to be like God. I want to be pure as the New Testament defines pure thinking and living. And I want to go to heaven. Now that's rather simple, it seems to me. But look how powerful those simple truths are when we put them into practice and what they will do for us on this earth. So easy to be distracted. So easy with most everybody around us, even religious people doing their own thing. False religions always let a person think he's all right with God, but then live any way you want to live. Worship him any way you want to. But the Lord's church, and all that it means to be the Lord's church, the spiritual body of Christ, the family of God, is always interested in doing things His way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me or unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And the simple measure of my love is that if you love me, ye will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. So if you're not a child of God this morning, we plead, we beg by the mercies of Christ that you humbly receive the truth concerning becoming a Christian. <laughs> and not be a part of any man-made church, but obey the gospel and be a member of the church that you read of in your own New Testaments. And as a child of God, if you've wandered from the pathways of righteousness, if you haven't been holy as you know you ought to be, you let things creep in. You're not striving to be as the Bible says. Then renounce those things, repent of them, come confessing them, and pray God for forgiveness. That's God's second law of pardon. I close many lessons, and I always am glad to close them with God wants you to be saved. God's ready to forgive you if you will but comply with his will humbly and from the heart. So if you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.